He wants to eat Baby Yoda. <laughs> That's right. Hi, I'm Richard Fox, co-author of Hell's Horizon. And I'm Jonathan Brazy. I'm the other co-author for Hell's Horizon. The book is told in alternating chapters, one from the Marine Commander and one from the Army Commander as they fight against each other to accomplish their mission. As the fight goes on, each realizes that they have more in common than they dare to admit, and their own codes of honor may be what leads them and their men to survive the war. But when the fighting is bloody, and Marines and soldiers are dying, can you afford to do anything else except to try to kill the other side? So for me, the biggest, best thing about this audiobook is that was, this story has two distinct parts, two distinct halves. It's got two distinct narrators. And not only are these just any narrators that anyone could just call them up and put them in a phone booth and have them say their lines. No, it is Eric Dane and Giancarlo Esposito who are two of the best, most talented actors out there right now. And when Podium Audio told me that Eric Dane was the one who was going to be reading for Major Richter, I was amazed because I knew Mr. Dane from uh, The Last Ship. It's a very, it's a great series on TBS. And so I knew, hey, this guy's played a military officer for years. He's gonna nail it, no worries. And then I told my friends and family about it, and my wife, my, my mother, and my sisters kept going on and on about someone named McSteamy. And I was like, who? who? So finally I figured it out, and then like, okay, I guess um, that's good too. And for me, I was waiting for Podium to tell me uh, who might be interested in doing this. And then when I heard that Giancarlo Esposito Gus was Frank. thinking about it, yes, Gus, Gus, I just, I went crazy because I am a big fanboy. And, all I, and, and they said, don't, we don't know it's for sure. It may not happen. I'm just praying, praying. My character is a, what we call a Mustang. Uh, he was a sergeant who, who was awarded a, the highest medal available in the Alliance. And because of that, he was bumped up to second lieutenant. However, he doesn't feel that he's been accepted really by the other officers. He didn't go to the academy. He doesn't go to the officers club and drink his tea with his little finger in the air. You know, he's, he likes a beer. And so he always has a little bit of a chip on his shoulder. And he's trying to do a good job and he's trying to gain the respect of the Marines and the officers alike. But it is a big step going from sergeant to officer where as a sergeant, you're fighting. As an officer, you're leading and guiding. And I thought that that dichotomy of the change that you have to make would make him an interesting character. And for me, Major Richter, he is a true believer in a system that really does not deserve him as a true believer. He was, as we say, real close to the flagpole growing up. And then through uh, reasons not of his fault and not of his own desire or making, he gets pushed to the side because, just simply because of internal politics. Well, I, uh, I did 30 years in the Marine Corps, four years in the Navy. I enlisted in the Navy in 1975. Never went to boot camp because I got my appointment to the Naval Academy. Wanted to be a SEAL initially, and then I was going to be a nuke power guy. But once I found out what nuke power was like, I really wanted to be a Marine. He took the test and didn't do as well. <laughs> so I took my commission in the, in the Marine Corps and I, I became an infantry officer. I had, did my infantry platoon down at Camp Lejeune, went to Fort Benning when I was a midshipman. And then I went to the BUDS, which is the SEAL indoctrination program in Coronado. So I, became, I was a parachute scuba and that was probably the greatest thing to do in the Marine Corps because I was being paid, paid dive pay, being paid parachute pay to actually do things like jump out of an airplane, land in the ocean, shuck your parachute, put on the scuba tanks, and swim down to a submarine. And if they're gonna pay you to do that, that is a sweet, sweet gig. Um, went to uh, the Pentagon, I was an infantry company commander, I uh, had other command tours, my, my big command tour was an MSSG, I was at uh, Okinawa, I was a float on several ships, uh, I was at the Hawaii twice. I, uh, I finished my career as a colonel in, in Iraq where I was the a military liaison to USAID. Um, rumor has it, I was told by an Army Lieutenant Colonel that I actually had a bounty on my head. Oh. But it was only $10,000. Insulting. It is insulting. insulting. It should have been a lot more than yeah. that. Always. 
And if you've ever seen John Brzee walk into a room, you know who he is because his knuckles drag on the carpet the whole way through. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Uh, for me, I graduated from West Point in 2001, and then from there I was stationed at Fort Polk, Louisiana. I, uh, then after that I went to Iraq for my first tour, and there we was, I was with 2nd HDR, and we were stationed at uh, the, uh, the Green Zone. And for the most part, I was at the Baghdad airport for most of that tour, and then I got put in a, uh, what's called a MIT team, a military integration training team. I sure hope I said that acronym right, where I worked with the Iraqi army on a day-to-day -day basis. And that was in Mamoudia and Ludafiyah, and down in the part of Iraq colloquially known as the Triangle of Death. And when I found out I was going to be stationed in the Triangle of Death, I did not tell that to my mother. After that, that was another 15 month tour. And you think just because they tell you at the beginning it's gonna be 15 months, it's gonna go fast. It does not go any faster. Not after 15 months, no. See, that's the difference in, in, in the Marines. When they say you're going there for nine months, it is nine months. See, that's how the Marines work. Yeah. Wow, this is the question you, when you answer, you end up upsetting everyone. <laughs> yeah. But for me, my favorite science fiction movie is going to be Robocop because it has a good deal about what it is to be a human being, what happens when people start getting augmented by machinery. And then you also have the very notion of, of self-determination. And then what happens when someone or something like a corporation says, no, no, this is what you will do. And how does someone fight back from that? So, and then also comes with a nice dose of ultraviolence, which just makes everything better. Once again, you've got a wide variety of science fiction movies. But if I had to pick one uh, as my favorite, I think it would probably be Aliens. Just because of the how well it was made. The action, the story. You gotta love the alien. I know, I know they're the bad guys, but you know some some people are kind of rooting for the alien over Ripley there. And if I might have made a little noise while I was watching it, that was not a scream. I promise you. My parents took me to see Aliens in the theater when I was eight years old. Yeah, good job, mom and dad. That has not had any <laughs> lasting implications at all. <laughs> All right, for those of you who have been paying attention to what's in the background, you might have noticed my Stormtrooper helmet from my 501st outfit, and also the Dragon Award right before you from 2017, which I won for the novel Iron Dragoons. I have never won a Dragon Award. I was nominated for one, but I was also nominated for two Nebulas, and you were only nominated for one. But something you haven't been, I am a poster boy for the United States Marine Corps. This young stud right there, is yours truly. I would never have been the poster boy for anything in the army, <laughs> except maybe bad decisions. <laughs>